Thank you very much for that very warm and generous introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here with you today and having the opportunity to share with you some thoughts about how we can drive progress using AI uh, going forward and revive productivity growth. Uh, back in 1982, uh, Time magazine, for the first time, replaced humans on its front cover and made the PC the machine of the year. And as Time noted at the time, uh, progress in computing had been nothing short of extraordinary. If we had seen similar progress in the automotive industry, it noted a Rolls Royce would cost less than $3. Uh, and needless to say, progress in computing didn't stop there. Moore's law continued for another four decades, driving down the costs of computing to the degree that we all now have the world's knowledge stored in our pockets. And with improvements in cognitivity, for the first time, scientists and the brightest minds around the world could communicate at ease, and we saw the greatest surge in patenting and innovation activity that the world has ever seen. It is therefore strikingly puzzling that our economies have not seen the boom that a lot of people expected. In fact, it takes 17 times as many engineers today to deliver more slow as it did back in 1982. And the stagnation that we've seen in computing is happening all across the board. It's happening in the United States, it's happening in Europe, it's even happening in China. And this is not just an artifact of mismeasurement. Mis stagnation is real and is happening. And so the key question of our time is, how can we leverage AI to reverse course and make our economies grow again? As a hint, I think the first thing to note is that all technologies are not created equal. Consider two examples, the automatic elevator and the telescope. All that the automatic elevator did was essentially getting rid of the operator. That is strikingly different from the telescope, which allowed us to look at the moons of Jupiter and explore the universe for the very first time. One technology was about automation, the other technology was about doing new and previously inconceivable uh, things. Now, automation is certainly important, especially to solve our demographic challenges and the decline in fertility rates and older uh, populations. But eventually, it runs into diminishing returns. Imagine if all we had done since 1800 in terms of technological progress was automation. We would have sheep te textiles and productive agriculture, but we wouldn't have antibiotics, we wouldn't have vaccines, we wouldn't have airplanes, we wouldn't have computers, we wouldn't have most of the things that have driven growth and prosperity for the past 200 years. The first industrial revolution was essentially about automation. It was about the mechanization of textile production. And growth in this period was quite fast compared to what it had previously been. But it was nothing like the modern rates of growth that we've seen. And more importantly, perhaps, as mechanization took off, wages for production workers, craftsmen, actually fell, which produced a wave of social unrest, including the Luddite riots. Uh, if it hadn't been for the second industrial revolution, progress would have stalled. And I think it is important to note that what we saw in terms of progress during the 20th uh, century was remarkably different. Uh, with the internal combustion engine, we produced the biggest manufacturing operation in human history around automotives, an entirely new industry. That is not to mention 
the producers of all components that go into the cars, the producers of the machine tools that go, uh, are needed to produce the components, as well as the rise of road commerce and mass tourism that accompanied the car. The same happened with electricity. Essentially, every gadget you have in your home stems from this era. That's a wave of new industries, a wave of new jobs being created. So whereas the first Industrial Revolution was about the mechanization of textile production, progress in the 20th century, which saw extraordinarily high growth rates, uh, were about creating new and previously inconceivable things. Unfortunately, the computer revolution so far has not quite lived up to the expectation. Yes, it has created new industries, but not the same uh, in terms of magnitude of jobs and size. And most of the productivity gains have actually centered on automating old industries. As robots have entered the factories, for example, that has driven down wages for production workers, and it has created much of the discontent that we're seeing today. And so the question for us going forward is, how can we use AI not just to do what we're already doing a bit more productively and automate existing operations, how can we use it to create new and previously inconceivable things? And we need, more than anything else, startups and the next generation of entrepreneurs to answer that precise question. Because firms tend to invent different types of technologies. Large companies, incumbents that have scale, and they're very much focused on bringing what they're already doing to the market at the lower cost. And so they're focusing on process innovation and automation. Startups, on the other hand, are focused on creating new uh, products, new jobs, new types of opportunities. And this is a particularly striking challenge in Europe, where the largest companies today are over 100 years old. If you compare that to the United States, the top five firms by market cap on average are around 40 years old, right? It's a striking difference. Uh, but it's not just you know, in, in Europe where this is a problem. Actually, even in the United States, startups are not actually inventing new jobs at the pace as they used to. We, see a we are seeing a decline in new firm formation, and we are seeing a decline in jobs being created by those kind of firms. Now, unfortunately, one of the challenges that AI is not going to solve for us is that innovation challenge. Imagine, for example, having an LLM back in 1900 trying to predict whether humans would ever be able to fly. All it would have been able to look back on was a data set of past failed attempts to fly and numerous deaths. Uh, it might have concluded that, well, birds are able to fly, so at least that gives us some uh, cause for optimism. Uh, but in looking at the data, it would also have concluded that no bird that weighs more than 30 pounds is uh, actually able to get off the ground. So even data on birds would have suggested that humans would probably never be able to fly, right? Uh, using LLMs for science and innovation is a little bit that, like conducting discovery by majority vote, whereby an LLM, for example, tries to you know, predict the next word in, in the sentence. What AI can do, though, is lower the barriers to innovation. Just like before the 20th century, uh, where only the wealthy had servants to do most of the tedious things for them, in the 20th century, a host of electric appliances uh, you know, entered people's homes and gave rise to the electric servant, AI today can, in principle, allow anybody to have a number of research assistants in their pockets. And that uh, should be some cause for optimism. And we really do need that optimism, because uh, in the end of the day, uh, growth 
and progress depends on it, right? An economy without economic growth essentially becomes a zero-sum game whereby you can only improve your standard of living at the expense of somebody else. And not quite surprisingly, periods of slow growth have seen protectionist policies, restrictions on migration, zero-sum thinking, which aligns with the state of the economy. Conversely, periods of economic expansion tends to be accompanied by positive sum thinking, which can create a virtuous cycle whereby people create new products, new types of jobs and tasks using AI. And that is really the kind of positive thinking we need in order to produce a future of shared prosperity and revive our economies uh, for the productivity boom that we should all be hoping for. Thank you very much.